Welcome to lecture number 16. Today we talk about energy and I want to approach the subject of energy today from the end. So I will discuss how a renewable energy system will look in maybe 50 years from now. This lecture is building up on all the lectures I gave previously. So I will shortly summarize what we have learned up to now and where we stand and where we want to go. Already in lecture number one, I asked the question, can we solve the global energy problem? And my answer was, yes, we can. But of course, I still have to verify that and convince you that this is really possible. Then in lecture number three, I showed you the challenge of the world energy supply. So I explained you that our society today on the whole globe uses about 12,000 gigawatts of power. This is the equivalent of about 12,000 nuclear power plants. The power is consumed by all of us. A big fraction is transport and industry. And also a lot of the energy gets lost on the way to the consumer. Then I tried to convince you in lecture number four that nuclear energy is not the solution that will not solve our future energy problems. The main reason are two inherent risks of nuclear energy, which is the decay heat and the proliferation. And those two things, we will have problems to get it under control. Also nowadays, nuclear power is economically not competitive anymore. So nuclear power is not the solution for us. Then in the following lectures I try to convince you that the era of fossil fuels is over nowadays and this is because by the usage of fossil fuels there is an inherent emission of CO2. CO2 has two bad effects on our environment. First is the greenhouse effects which leads to global warming and rise of sea levels and so on. And secondly CO2 goes into the oceans and makes an acidification of the oceans, which is bad for the ecosystems of all the oceans. Industry still sees a future in fossil fuels by applying CCS. CCS means carbon dioxide capture and storage. And I try to explain you why this is also not a future option from our point of view. Then in lecture 14, I summarized all the effects on the climate and tried to explain you that it is still possible to stop and even to reverse global warming. And there's a list of options which we have to apply. And the first and most important one, of course, is that we have to stop the usage of fossil fuels. And to stop the combustion of fossil fuels means, first of all, that we have to change our energy system, as you know, and I'm convinced that there's no other chance than going to a renewable energy system. Therefore, in today's lecture, I will give you the basic overview about how the future renewable energy system has to look like. And the question is, how do we achieve this kind of energy transition? So if I ask at the beginning of this lecture series, the question, can we solve the global energy problem? And I said, yes, we can. Still, it does not tell you how to do it and what the actions are we have to do. A typical approach, especially from politics, is the one as outlined here. First, you ask, where are the problems? Then, as a politician, you are inside a system of stakeholders. So you have to have a look at the population. You have to look at the industry. You have to look at the rich people. And then you have to think about the options which you still have and which of these options are positive to all the stakeholders. And then you can ask the question, what can we change step by step to improve the situation, to slowly solve the problem and still stay in power? As a natural scientist, of course, this is not your preferred option. Normally in science, if you have a problem, you solve it and you get the correct answer and that's it. Of course, in such a global complex system, this approach may not work. But nevertheless, I think as a scientist, it's your duty to present options and to present the optimum options in some sense. And then as a second step, the politics still has to evaluate that and decide how to reach 
one of these options. So the approach which I want to take in this lecture is the first step is done by science and we want to decide from the scientific point of view where will the final destination of our energy transition be. Of course we can come to the conclusion at the end that there are many options. We might also come to the conclusion that we will never reach our goal. It might also be that in the far future there are new technologies, there are new circumstances which need a completely different solution. But nevertheless, I believe the best what scientists can do today is that they take the actual situation as it is predicted for the next 50 and 100 years. We take the existing technology or the kind of technology which is currently being developed and where we have confidence that it will exist in the coming years. And then we put those things together into a system and then under these conditions you can, with scientific arguments, find the best solution or the best solutions among several prerequisites that you put in. For example, how big is the risk you want to take for the future. And then the second step is, once you know where you want to go, the question, what path will you take? What is the way of transition you prefer? How much money does it cost? And do the people want it this way? And do they follow your path? This is then a subject which is more up to the politicians. But nevertheless, science has to have a big word in telling what is possible and what is impossible. So now we come to the development of a future renewable energy system from the scientific point of view. And a future renewable energy system will have the following four blocks. We have to talk about energy production, energy transport, energy storage and energy consumption. And in all the decisions and diagrams we draw, we have to ask the question, is that the only way to do it or are there other options? So the scientific justification for writing down these four blocks is basically the physics law of energy conservation. And we will talk about that later again. So the law of energy conservation tells you that you cannot produce energy from nothing. Actually, in the strict sense from physics, you cannot even produce energy, you can just convert forms of energy. So if we talk about energy production, in our sense, what we mean is we convert a kind of natural energy into a form of energy which we can use as humans. For example, we take the solar light and convert it into solar electricity and then the electricity can be used for a lot of purposes. So that's what we mean with energy production. And because of the law of energy conservation, if we want to consume energy, we have to produce it first. So we have to convert existing energy into a form which we can use. Then normally the point of production and the position of consumption is not the same. So you have to transport energy. And because we are talking about renewable energies, the renewable energies are not always available. Sun is not shining at night. So if you at night want to watch TV, you have to store the solar energy from the day somehow to be able to use it at a later time. So energy storage has a very important function in our renewable energy system. That was not the case in previous times because in previous times where you use coal or oil or gas or nuclear power, you did not have to store electricity. So for example, in the fossil energy system, you took the coal out of the ground, you transported the coal, you stored the coal in front of your power plant and then you produced energy when it was needed. So at this time, the energy storage was in the form of the energy carriers. Today in a renewable system, this is more complicated and more important because of the fluctuations of the natural energies like solar power and wind power and because we have to store now electricity also and not only energy carriers like coal or uranium. 
So each of the conclusions we draw in our study of the renewable energy systems, we have to really verify scientifically. So if you are very strict, of course, the diagram I draw here can also be the other way around. You can, of course, also store the energy at the point of production, then transport it to the consumer, or you do it the other way around. You transport the energy to the consumer and store it locally. With the diagram here, of course, I don't mean to distinguish between those two. It's just that we have to talk about these boxes in detail and to find the best solutions for the boxes. And then at the, at the end, you ask at which position and in which order you do those things. To elaborate these four boxes a bit more in detail, there are lots of people, especially in the solar community, who want to reduce the system just to two blocks. You produce the energy and you consume the energy at the same location. This becomes possible by renewable energies to a large extent. So the best example is the photovoltaics on the roof of a house and then inside of your house you consume it. This is the people who prefer to have small and local solutions to our energy system. This has a lot of advantages, but for a global energy system this alone is not sufficient as I will explain later. As a scientist you normally take a complex system and cut it into segments and first study the segments. In our case it is these four boxes. Now we have to study in detail how to arrange each of these boxes, what is the optimal solution of each of the boxes, what are the possibilities, and then at the end only you put everything together to a complex system. So if now you talk about the first box, energy production, you have of course as a scientist to discuss all the possibilities which you have for energy production, or better let's say it, for the conversion of natural power into usable power. So at some point in this lecture we will talk about this box in detail. So we will discuss photovoltaic, we will discuss solar thermal power, we will discuss wind power onshore and offshore, we will talk about hydropower and all the other options which we have. There, of course, we also have to talk about the scale of energy which is possible. As we talk about the total amount of 16,000 gigawatt, we have to find solutions which can cover the big scale of energy. And of course, not all options are available everywhere. And here we come then to one of the critical questions which have led to long discussions in the past. <coughs> we have to talk about how to set up the energy system. Do we want to do it? locally or do we want to do it at the best sites? What do I mean with that? For example, if you want to do it locally, you have to use those energies which are available on site. If you want to use solar power and you live in an area where there is little sun, like somewhere in the north of Scandinavia, then you have different options than if you live in the south of Spain, because there is a lot more solar power available. The other option is you go to the best sites. So you check on the map where there's most of the solar power. So you go, for example, to the deserts, like the desert in Nevada, or the desert in the Sahara, or the desert Gobi in China. There you have really a lot of power available. Or you take wind power and you find out that wind power is very strong, for example, at the coast of Morocco or in the north of Scandinavia. So you can have two different attitudes. Either you want to do it locally and then you have to pay a higher price for the production of the energy, but you need less transport and you are politically maybe less dependent from all other people. Or you transport energy from the desert to Europe, for example. Like 10 years ago, there was a big discussion on that, especially in Germany. We had the Desertec Foundation, which promoted the idea to produce energy at large scale, mainly solar and wind energy in Africa, and transport it to Europe. And then we had associations like Eurosolar, led by Hermann Scher, and they 
promoted the idea to have local production of energy and especially independent from big companies, as they thought. In the next block of our lecture, we have to talk about energy transport. Here also, there will have to be a lot of changes and transport will have a much bigger importance, especially the transport of electricity. Very important here is the option to separate the distribution network, which we all know in our countries, from the long distance transmission of electricity. So you could compare it to having small roads and you also have autobahn. And for the autobahn, for the long distance transportation of electricity, there's a novel technology available since a few decades and this is what we call the high voltage DC transportation. So it uses DC direct current instead of AC alternating current to transport electricity. This we will have to talk about. The other question is, which is also very important, shall we mainly transport electricity or shall we mainly transport chemical energy carriers like gas or oil? Because even in a renewable energy system, you can produce in a renewable way also chemical energy carriers. So you arrive at synthetic gases, synthetic fuels, but also things like biogas and biofuels and biomass. These are chemical energy carriers in a renewable energy system which you can transport. And therefore, we have to talk about all these options and find out which options are best suited for certain purposes. Now we come to the third block which we have to discuss about the energy storage. And there the biggest confusion and uncertainty is around since many decades because energy storage is much more important in a renewable energy system than in a fossil or nuclear energy system as I explained before. And the main difficulty here is that most of the primary energies which are available like wind power or solar power are available in the form of electricity so we have to find new and efficient ways to store electricity. The biggest mistakes which have often been made by the people who say a renewable energy system will not work, it's impossible, it's too expensive. The biggest mistake they made often is that they took a certain storage device for electricity and explained how ex expensive this is. What they forgot about is that you can adapt your storage system for electricity to the time scale which it stores. This was not important in the old days so much, but if you want to have electricity storage at large scale, you have to do it in a more sophisticated way than before. And the main thing is you have to talk about the time scales. If you analyze that, and that will be discussed later in much more detail, you find out that renewable energies have fluctuations and the consumer has fluctuations and these fluctuations have mainly two time scales. The first one is the day and night cycle because at day and at night the consumption is different and at day and at night all the solar energy is different. At night there is no solar energy. So this is one important time scale. The second important time scale is the difference of summer and winter, at least in the northern half of our planet. Like here in Europe, we have much more wind in the winter and we have much more sun in the summer. So there are big differences between the renewable energy systems in summer and winter. And for those time scales, we need separate storage systems. And this is what we call the dual storage system. You have a short time storage, which does the daily storage. It cares about the day and night difference. It must have a high efficiency and it is quite expensive because at short time scale it has to provide a lot of storage cycles. The second storage system is a long term storage. This is a seasonal storage. Each of these storage cycles may take weeks or months. So it cares about periods where there is a lot of wind or a lot of sun compared to periods over weeks and months where you have a deficit of the solar or wind power. This storage has to be really huge. 
it has to have very large capacities, but for these time scales, you can use very cheap storage. So if you split your energy storage systems into these two dual systems, the total becomes much cheaper than if you do everything with the same type of system. This will be very important and is a very important ingredient from the scientific point of view on the economy of the renewable energy system. And then we come at the last block to the consumer. So the consumer consists mainly out of three parts. The first one is the conventional electricity user, like you want to watch TV, you want to run your computer, you want to switch on light in your house. All those things are typically done with electricity. About one third of the energy consumption goes to mobility. And this nowadays is almost completely using petrol. So it's almost 100% fossil fuel. And then the third type of consumer just uses heat. So either for climatization to produce heat or coldness. And then also in industry, you need heat. And in big parts of the world, you have to heat your houses. And this takes a lot of energy. So these three types of energy consumption they have to be rethought, each of them. The main question always will be, is there a way to save energy? Can you reach the same aim with less energy? For example, for heating your houses, the alternative is you insulate your house better, so you need much less energy. The other point which you will find out is that most of the applications become more effective if you use electricity. So even electrical heating, which normally is very expensive and not a very good way to do it, turns out that if you use modern technology, like using heat pumps, an electrical heating will be the most efficient way in future. And the same, of course, is true for mobility. The reason is that electricity has much higher efficiencies in conversion normally. So if you have an electric car, the efficiency is close to 100% to convert electrical power into motion. If you have a normal car with a combustion engine, then the efficiency is below 50%, sometimes maybe even 30%. So you lose a lot of energy in all kinds of technologies, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of the things will have to be converted into electricity before the user makes use out of it. So electricity, as we will see in the coming lectures, will, be, will have a dominant position as a very efficient energy carrier. But not everything will be electric. If you think about storage again, you will find out that electricity storage at huge capacities is not practicable, is efficient, but not cheap, so it requires a lot of resources. There are other ways to store energy, and we will see that hydrogen will have a dominant role here, and we come to that also later. Before we end this lecture, I want to show you the final result of what comes out of all these studies, so that you already know where we are heading, and I will use the coming lectures to verify the system which I will present you now. So what will come out? We need power production, as I said, and it turns out that the main part of the production will be solar and wind power. This is the kind of power which is scalable everywhere on the world. In addition, of course, we also will use biogas and hydropower and all the other options which we have. Concerning transportation, the electrical grid will have a central position in the renewable energy system, as I mentioned before. And we will have to split our electricity grids into a distribution network, which connects every small producer and every small consumer. And in addition, we will need a high voltage overlay network, which connects the different centers of production and consumption on the long scale. There we are talking about connecting different countries and even different continents. The electrical autobahn will be using DC direct current. It's a so-called HVDC technology, high voltage 
direct current technology and this will enable us to do international power trade but from the physics point of view it's much more important by reducing fluctuations on the big scale. In addition to the power grid, we will have a second type of connections which distributes chemical energy carriers. The first one to think about is biogas, but as we will see later, synthetic gas or synthetic fuels will play a very important role for storage. And therefore, in addition to the electricity grid, we can also efficiently build up a grid of either gas or liquid pipelines or the standard gas or liquid carriers in, for example, big vessels. These are all options. And then the details on what fraction of the total system these options will take in future. This is, of course, then a question of optimization. Then, as I said, very important for the renewable energy system is the storage. Let's start with the short-term storage. The short-term storage is shown here. An important ingredient of short-term storage are batteries, but also pump storage. And if you are in deserts, you can use concentrated solar power, including heat storage. So that are the important pieces of short-term storage. And then we will need a separate system of long-term storage. And from the scientific point of view, it seems almost certain that the long-term storage will use gases or synthetic fuels. The way it works is the following. You take a primary energy source like solar and wind power, which is available in electrical form, and then you do power to gas. So you convert electrical power into a chemical energy carrier. The most natural one is hydrogen. Other options are methane or even liquids like alcohol or there's a long list of other possible chemical energy storage systems. The storage of chemicals is very cheap. We already have in many countries huge gas storage for natural gas and we have cheap ways to convert the chemical stuff back to electricity, for example gas turbines are a simple way to produce electricity out of natural gas, for example. A very modern way to do it is the LOHC. LOHC means liquid organic hydrogen carrier. So this is a system which uses hydrogen and you don't store hydrogen here in a tank under high pressure, but you store the hydrogen chemically in a liquid, which is easier to storage and where you can have very high densities of hydrogen. And of course, because now chemical storage like hydrogen is available at large scale for the long-term storage, you can of course also trade that. So the far distance trade of, for example, liquid organic hydrogen carriers, LOHCs, is possible over the whole globe. And this makes renewable energies to a stuff which is tradable like the oil was tradable at the old days and even using the same vessels, the same storage devices. And now finally we come to the last block. This is the block of the consumption. As I mentioned before, the consumption will be mainly converted into electricity for reasons of efficiency and practicability. So that means electricity consumption will become the main part of our energy system. Of course, in future, we will still use electrical light, LEDs, to light our houses. But we also have the option to use electricity for heating our house using heat pumps, which can be very efficient. And even for mobility, we can have EVs, electrical vehicles. But of course, there are applications which are more efficient or more useful if you do it using chemical energy carriers like hydrogen, LOHC or liquid synthetic fuels. In those cases, of course, there's the option to use them also in future, especially if we use, for example, hydrogen for long-term storage. 
Of course, we should also use hydrogen for the consumption in those areas where it's practical. I could imagine that there will be cars using LOHC or planes in future to use these energy carriers because they are renewable and you can store them at high intensities. This is already the end of this first lecture on the energy systems of the future. I will come in the coming lectures to all these blocks in much more detail. I will follow somewhat the agenda which is in my book. And of course there are a lot of detailed questions which we have to solve so that we can really at the end say from the scientific point of view the future energy system is quite clear so that then at the end the only step still to do is to find an optimal path from today to the future renewable energy system from the point of view of today. This then is mostly a political and economical question but also there we will have some guidelines. So thank you for listening and hope to see you next time again. Goodbye.